Um, and here we go. Let's get started. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Great Life, Greater Impact. I am so excited to present this topic to you. We've been talking about sovereignty, spiritual sovereignty all year. And my heart is feeling a little bit of sadness for uh, the coming to the conclusion of this topic because it's been such a tender subject to me. I, th I feel like I've learned so much this year in having these conversations with all of you. And, um, and I appreciate your presence. I appreciate your wisdom. And I welcome the um, contribution of any and all who feel inspired or prompted to share what you've been learning about these things too, because um, my disclaimer is I am not your guru. I'm, I'm just here to facilitate conversation. Um, I'm here willing to share some of the things that I've been observing and noticing in life. And, um, and if that resonates with you, awesome. If it doesn't, um, keep what resonates and throw out the rest. Uh, don't try to make it fit you. Um, some of you, some of you guys that attend these classes have varying different, uh, belief systems and places that you come from spiritually speaking. So with that being said, I want to introduce a topic today. It just, it came just this morning. I remembered that last time we had our class, we were talking about the, the summary of sovereignty. We covered 14 different principles or aspects of what we could talk. I mean, we talked to death about sovereignty this year, but we, we covered 14 of those principles last, last week. Um, in the aspects of sovereignty, but there was a piece um, from the handout that we did not get to because there wasn't time. And so that has to do with sovereign relationships. What does it mean to have sovereignty in your relationships? Because that's where it really starts to get dicey. I mean, it's easy for us, it's easy for people to just kind of um, float around in the world as an autonomous being and come and go as you please and do what you want. But then when you start bumping into other people, that's where sovereignty really gets a little bit more complicated for all of us. We've talked in the past about how sovereignty has a lot to do with self-governance. It has to do with spiritual autonomy. It has to do with being deeply rooted in self-love so that you can access the love of God um, and vice versa. It's being deeply rooted in God's love for you so that you can deep, so you can access deeply the love of yourself. And those two things really are so divinely integrated that they can't be separated. So the love of self, love of God. Uh, we have also talked about how it's through that love of God and through that love of self that then you connect to the web of love, which is all around you. So that's the topic for today is spiritual sovereignty in relationships. And I'm excited to get after that. This I have a few principles that I'm going to share with you. If it um, sparks any inspiration in you or revelation in you, then I encourage you to share because a lot of people will benefit when we all collaborate together. And um, it's my prayer and my intention that we're going to flow in this conversation through the spirit of revelation today. Um, gosh, there was something else I wanted to say. I'll just do an introduction. How about that? Hi, I'm Janet. I'm a quantum healing practitioner and a soul self-restoration coach. I do one-on-one -on -one mentoring. And what I do is I help take people to the uncharted waters of who they really are for healing, for spiritual awakening for personal transformation and self-awareness. And I was thinking about this this morning, like, could there be a more important work for you to be doing than this? <laughs> this is the meaning of life. It's to know yourself and to know God and how you relate to God. And it's why, um, I'm just going to reiterate, um, it's why I feel that this principle of sovereignty that we've talked about for an entire year now is leading us to the next topic in 2024, which is going to be the divine identity of Christ and why that matters to you. Because <clears throat> I think it's important for us to have an understanding of why. Why does that matter that we understand his divine identity so that you can understand yours? Um, he's the perfect pattern 
for what divine identity actually looks like. And um, so I, I'm, I'm really like, I cannot wait to dive in and start talking about some of these topics as we come into the new year. But let's talk about spiritual sovereignty in your relationships. Um, I've been thinking about the concept of Zion, you know, in, in religious culture, often we talk about Zion. We talk about um, creating a Zion community and a Zion culture and what that looks like. And, um, you know, in if you study the ancient, like the ancient emerald tablets, records from this earth of cultures who have created Zionistic societies like Enoch, the city of Enoch, the city of Atlantis and Lemuria and other places who have records showing that they did create societies where love was the principal medium that bonded the society together. So even though it was a collective group of sovereign, spiritually sovereign beings, and they were free to be themselves autonomously, they were one. How did they do that? Um, you know, the world has tried to create societies like that through communism, um, but it didn't create any oneness and there was no freedom. So these are elements that have to be present if a society like that is going to be birthed. And I, I've been thinking a lot about um, it in terms of creating a Zion society. It's done through relationship. It's done through the relationships that you have with many. So Zion for me is um being one with many how do we do that any thoughts any ideas do you guys are you having bursts or epiphanies or revelations that you'd like to share if you do unmute interrupt type something into the chat feel free to do that um i also feel like so if if creating a zion society is um, fostering one relationship at a time where we can all be one, then what does this look like in our interpersonal, interconnected relationships? I see that Mike has a comment or a statement. Go ahead. I was just going to say to answer your question on like, how do you foster relationships as one with many starts with you you foster that relationship with yourself. And as you do that, you raise your vibration and then that attracts those same people that are on the same vibration to you. And so that's where, you know, and then you learn to create more meaningful relationships because it's a, a relationship that that's, uh, I want to, I don't know how to say the word reciprocity or whatever, you know, reciprocated. Mm -hmm. And so it's not, you don't feel drained all the time because you're always giving, you know, it's like a give and take relationship and it's, it's not one sided relationship. So it's more meaningful and more abundant. That is the most beautiful thing I've heard all day. Thank you for sharing that. And that is profound wisdom that just came out. I'm so proud of you. I, I'm just so proud of you. You have come through so much in your life and, um, and are definitely an example of one who is seeking after oneness with people and, and through relationships. So thank you for sharing that, Mike. I really, really do appreciate that. That was tremendous wisdom. Um, and I see that you have a comment. Go ahead. Well, actually he just stole my lines. <laughs> How rude. So I just want to say I support all of that, Mike. That was beautiful. It does begin with yourself, right? Because if you, like you say, know thyself, if you don't know yourself and have an amazing relationship with you first, it, it becomes a struggle or almost impossible to have relationships and have that unity and connection with everyone else. So just piggybacking on what you said. Yeah, I I agree. That's beautiful. Um, I had a quote. I think I shared this a couple of weeks ago in one of our past classes, but it is, you are a clear open space for the light of divinity to enter this world. 
hold on, let me let someone into the class. The divine is always within you. You're not here to build up your character. The truth is that the light of divinity is what is experiencing itself as you. Um, and I think too, in when it comes to sovereignty in relationships, we're all seeking for connection. I think that as human beings, we crave connection with others. But like what Mike said, um, we it's important that we get centered and and Anne said this too. We get centered and rooted and stable and grounded in ourself because that's where it begins, is through that knowing of self and connecting with the true self and realizing that you don't need, you're not a um, partial person that needs to be fulfilled by connecting to someone else. Um, you're not looking for your other half in order to be made whole. You're not looking for someone else to gift you the things that you're lacking. That's not what we're here to do. We're here to find wholeness through self and through connection with the divine, through God, whatever that looks like for you, I'm not here to define that, but um, <clears throat> that's what we're here to do first. And then we can extend those arms out in outreach um, and share that connection interdependently instead of codependently. I think that um, there's an epidemic on this planet of codependency. That's what we're taught. That's what we're conditioned that's how we're programmed is to be clingy and needy and wanty and to throw out expectation onto other people like you owe me you owe me this you need to make me feel this way and if you can't make me feel that way then i have to hate you abandon you divorce you whatever <clears throat> and i think that that's something as spiritual sovereigns that we're starting to discover on our own journeys, everyone's discovering these things. Um, we're starting to realize no wholeness is found within. It's found by going within. Um, the relationship <clears throat> that you have with yourself is definitely, <clears throat> is definitely the starting point for developing that interconnectedness or oneness with another. <clears throat> A couple of, a couple of weeks ago, I was on a walk. Mike says, "I think the last few years have ex exacerbated codependency." Yeah, I think so too. It's coming through um, COVID and all of these things. The fear being projected out into society definitely has made people more clingy, for sure. <clears throat> but. I think that the examples of a few can definitely impact, make a greater impact on the world of many. Um, I, I'm going to tell my story. I'm going to finish my story. But before I do, this just popped into my head is that you relate to others the, the best, the greatest, when you are conscious of your own inner being. When you're conscious and present with your own inner being, that's when you don't have neediness or wantiness or clinginess or, or expectation that you throw around or project your vomit, your emotions up onto someone else and blame them for it. That's codependent. Rather, you go within, find the, the presence, the divine presence within you, the kingdom of God within you then you can share that with others. <clears throat> and I think that what that does for us is it puts us into the present moment now so that we can be more present fully with others so that we can look them in the eye and not need to take anything, but be in a state of constant giving. And, it, and like Mike said, when you're in a state of oneness with someone, there's no depletion. They're not going to drain and suck the life out of you they don't project onto you. There's just this interchange of, um, it's there's flow. That's what happens. Then you can be at ease with yourself because they're not constantly triggering you and making you feel insecure because you know that self-security comes from within, not from someone else. Um, so anyways, a few weeks ago, I was um, 
out, out on nature on a, a run. And, um, I distinctly heard the voice of God say to me, Janet, you are one with me. And I want you to now be one with these. And he shows me <clears throat> the faces of the people in my life that I interact with on a regular basis. I want you to be one with these. And I think that's the invitation for us all. It's, it's not difficult to be one with God. It's a little more challenging to be one with humans because we're not perfect and they're not perfect. And um, we sometimes will trigger one another and bring up old, old wounds in each other. So with that being said, we're going to, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, we're going to go back over to the handout that we worked on last week. Okay. Talking about sovereignty and relationships. Principle number one, a sovereign Sovereign uh, beings who enter into relationship with one another have little to no expectations that they place or project onto the other person. Placing very few, if any, expectations onto the ones you love frees them. If you can say to someone, hey, you owe me nothing, while at the same time receiving everything that they have to offer, with gratitude, it opens up space for free flow in the relationship. Then you can just be. And it's beautiful and it's magnetic and it's expansive and all the things that we're looking for because you're remembering your own wholeness. Principle number two, there are little to no arguments in a sovereign relationship because love is the common ingredient and <laughs> love of God, love of self. Those are the first primary common ingredients that both people have in a sovereign relationship. So what you're able to do is meet the other person exactly where they are. You don't try to fix them. You, 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 there's no need to fix you or them. You just allow them to process. You support them without being argumentative or disagreeable. You don't need to be the expert. You don't need to be the advice giver. You let them work through it. Um, our fixed mental positions on things ultimately have nothing to do with who we are. You can let these things go easily. And when you do, there's very little threat to either of you. I love that. I love the remembering of that. Um, several years ago, I had a friend, a really close friend, hadn't seen and Actually, it was the first time we'd ever met. And um, they were late, like about four hours late, which meant we only had just a very limited amount of time to spend with one another. And um, <laughs> they were so apologetic. And I said, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. You don't owe me anything. You don't you don't even owe me an explanation or an apology. Just be. Let's just be. There's no, I'm not mad. I'm not, I wasn't, I'm, I don't have expectation upon you. You do you. And I'm going to do me. And when you do, it helps you to tap into the flow of the present moment. And you realize however it plays out is the way it's supposed to. And there's no lack or limitation that you project or barf up onto the other person. Okay. Uh, number three, there's little to no fixing. You don't question each other or try to fix the other person. You don't try to see, um, you know, you do try to see their true identity and meet them exactly where they are. And you realize you are the problem. If there's a problem presenting itself, and you see it as a problem and you're not seeing them as a whole, complete, sovereign being, a divine being, then you are the problem. My teachers taught me, have you ever noticed that whenever there are problems in your life, you're always there? <laughs> and so if you're seeing things or other people as a problem, you need to look within and realize, oh, my perception of this situation is the problem. 
So there is no need to go and fix people or fix situations or fix things. Just meet them where they are, allow for the unfolding and operate. There doesn't mean you don't do anything. You operate based on your higher self, which is in a state of love and neutrality. There's no neediness. There's no wantiness. There's no holes to fill because everything is whole already. So you resolve it in you, and then you can go on having the relationship with them. Number four, be objective. Look at things objectively without trying to correct or fix the other person. It gives them space to process through what they are learning and where they are at in their journey. So being objective, being open-minded, keep an open heart and an open mind, even if you know that you're right. Mm -hmm. They don't always need to know that. That might not be important information for them to know. I'm right. You're wrong. You just need to change. That's not valid information, valuable information for them. Sometimes you just have to have an open mind and let them be where they're at. And you keep your opinions about rightness and wrongness to yourself. Unless... Unless you find yourself in a position where spirit guides you to rebuke someone gently, and we're going to get to that, that will be one of these aspects. Um, even if you know you're right, they don't always need to know that. Sometimes you can keep it to yourself if the spirit directs. Again, you're maneuvering, you're maneuvering, you're maneuvering and operating. I just made up a new word. <laughs> I think mine's better. Okay, you're operating um, from a space of um, sovereignty at that point. Uh, okay, I see that there's something in the chat. Hold on one sec. <laughs> Maneuverating. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I've invented a word. There we go. Number five, asking questions. So in sovereign relationships, what you can do with to connect because we all crave connection, right? That interdependent connection, create a place that feels safe enough to ask each other questions instead of trying to tell the other person all the answers. It's not your job. It's their job to figure out the answers for themselves because the answers to their problems is within them, not in you. So help them come to themselves by asking them questions that will get them to their own root. Number six, I love this principle is safety. If you're going to connect deeply with another soul and be one with them, there has to be a safe space. There has to be a feeling of, okay, this feels safe to me because there's no threat. So help to create a safe place where they can safely and intimately share without fear of you using the information against them. So in light of that, I want to, I've, um, I found these, I just found them online. I thought they were really good. So I'm going to share it with you in regards to number six, which is safety. Um, emotionally safe people, this is how emotionally safe people show up in relationships. Number one, they make sure that you feel that you are a priority to them. Number two, they reflect and validate your emotions and your experiences. They validate that you're having, you know, experiences and learning and emotions that that is valid. Number three, they set and hold boundaries with you and others. And they also, I'm going to add this, that they seek to know what your boundaries are so that they don't overstep the bounds. Uh, number three, they... Number four, they can accept feedback without becoming defensive. So they can listen to you. You can give them feedback. It's not going to trigger something unsafe in them. And then they scratch your eyes out, right? Um, five, they make time to engage in their own interests and hobbies and encourage you to do the same. I've said this a million times as we've talked about sovereignty, but no one has the right no one has the right to pull you off of your true soul's path, the experiences that you came here to have. Nobody has that right. Even if they call themselves your spouse, your mother, your father, your leader, your authority, whatever that looks like, nobody 
has the right to yank you off your soul's path. And so if you're on a journey and you feel guided in a specific direction, um, we, we, we owe that to one another. Am I wording that right? Maybe not, but uh, every human being deserves to pursue their own spiritual path and their own spiritual course. Um, so you hold space for that and encourage them. Number, I think this is six. They ask questions and hold space for your feelings, even if they don't always understand them. They just allow you to have the feelings that you're having. The next one, they recognize their own um, maladaptive behaviors and put effort into healing and personal growth. The next one, they show interest in the things that are important to you. So they're present with you. They make eye contact with you. They show an interest in the things that you care about. Um, and the last one, they're consistent in the ways that they show up for you. It's you never walking on eggshells wondering, how are they going to respond next? I don't know. You know, there's there's consistency because they're stable within themselves or you show up that way for them, right? It's it's there's reciprocity in that. Okay, so that was safety. Let's go to number seven, righteous rebuking. This is what I talked about earlier is that, you know, if spirit, um, when I said, you keep your opinions to yourself. You don't always have to keep your opinions to yourself. If spirit says, hey, this is something that needs to come out in the conversation, then you lovingly say it. But um, after you've created that safe space and you've validated their feelings and their experiences, then, then you can righteously rebuke, but not before. If you just go after them, it's going to feel like an attack. So certain circumstances call for boldness and sharp reproving or establishing healthy boundaries to prevent abuse. But <laughs> righteous rebuking will almost never be successful until you've done the other steps that we just talked about and creating that safe, healthy environment where they feel that you really do care about them and you're not just there to attack their, um, their being. It's scary to feel attacked and ganged up on. Okay, number eight, uh, beware of pride and the spirit of lust. Exclusivity, ownership, and lust was the downfall of Lucifer and Lilith. They wanted each other so badly they were willing to connive and cheat and steal and deceive and abuse in order to gratify what they wanted. Uh, they wanted to have each other. And there's there's a sense of ownership in there. So I, I would encourage and invite you to check yourself in your relationships. Do you feel a sense of ownership with another human? Um, or do you allow the humans in your life to be sovereign and autonomous and you show up the way that you show up? Um, where, where did I leave off? This ownership and exclusivity pulled them away from the network of divine love. Do you remember how we talked about um, um, when you say to someone, hey, you owe me nothing. I'm not going to project all my expectations of what I think the relationship is supposed to look like onto you because you just be you and that's perfectly fine. That's enough. When you do that, you set the person free and they can finally just be them. And, you know, the irony is when you let go of clinging to another person, and they're free to be them, they actually, it's attractive. They actually want to be with you because they're free to do so rather than being smothered by your uh, clinginess. And the last one for sovereign relationships is humility. Humility is the gateway to charity. And charity is really what we're all craving in all of our relationships with every, I mean, there's many different types of relationships that we can have, but charity is really what we're looking for in all of them. Charity is the highest, most pure love of Christ. It's the highest love that beings can enter into and express. 
So humility, if you want charity, humility is one of the most profound gateways that you can access charity. It's not the only one, but it is one of them. So be humble, be teachable, be patient, be kind, be long-suffering, be amiable, reprove with sharpness, but show forth an increase of love. If you want there to be charity in your relationships, the gateway is through a humble heart and a willingness to understand the other person and to walk in their shoes. I can't think of anything more desirable to experience in a relationship with another human being. And when you do experience that in your relationships with others, it's delicious just to be completely accepted by others. It's delicious. Could there be anything more amazing than that? To be seen, to be heard, to be cherished, to be acknowledged, to be valued, to be heard. I think I said that already. Could there be anything more attractive than that in our relationships? But what do we do often? (laughs) We manipulate and we control and we get very needy. It's all about wanting to fill our, having, have them fill our, our cup. It's not their job. It's not their job to fill you with love. It's your job to find the love that is inside of you and be that. Then you're ready to connect and share the best part of yourself with someone, but not in a codependent or a needy way or a manipulative way so you can get what you want or take, take, take. It's in an equally yoked in a oneness way. Now, this is the last point that I'm going to make, and then I'm going to open it up to you guys. Juliet says, can you explain reprove with sharpness? Yeah, I think reprove with sharpness goes back to that previous step that we talked about lovingly rebuking someone when they have crossed over boundaries or when they have when when you see that there's something that you could do to help in correcting behaviors that aren't healthy that's reproving with sharpness but you're not going to beat the crap out of them right you're you're going to be firm you're going to be bold you're going to tell the truth it, especially if the spirit directs you to do those things and we can do that with spouses. We can do it with children. We can do it with um, friends. And it's not easy to rebuke friends. I have friends who lovingly rebuke me who will say, "Mm, I'm going to just call this out. I'm going to call out some BS in you right now that I'm seeing. I'm going to call it out. So just hear me. And you know, if I'm in a humble place, Hopefully I am. I'm in a humble place that I'm not going to go into my childlike wounded self and scratch their eyeballs out because they rebuked me. I'm going to see it as, oh, this is constructive criticism and I needed to hear this. And I'm really grateful that they said it because I didn't see. I wasn't seeing. Oftentimes you don't see the picture when you're in the frame. Someone said that to me just this week. And it's true. And so if you have a loving friend that can kindly mirror back to you and reflect back to you, hey, I'm just seeing this. I'm just noticing this. Um, What's going on? Okay. That's it for me. Um, What are your thoughts? What are your epiphanies? What were your greatest takeaways? And do you have anything to add? Anybody feel free to open your mic, unmute, um, or share in the chat whatever you guys want. Okay, I'll share. (laughs) Um, So just taking everything in, you know, uh, the big picture, uh, I just keep thinking about one thing um, that I use that works for me and hopefully by sharing it, it will work for others too because you know, whether it's a relationship with self, relationship with others, uh, relationship with our world, uh, I think it's great to have something 
like a symbol or something that can remind you when you get so pulled away from self, you know, from your divine self to, to come back to that center, to that place. Yeah. And um, I know I've shared this before, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I use the sign of the cross and then I come to center, but simply just putting your hands over your heart. I feel that what that does for me is when I forget all these things that I've learned and all these things you've shared, Janet, that when I put my hands over my heart, I've already set the intention that now I'm home. And now that is the place from where I will react, respond, interact with people around me and interact with my world. Um, so I think developing something that works for everyone, whatever it is, just a physical way to have some sort of symbol, whether it's putting your hands together over your heart, whatever it takes, um, it can quickly remind you and pull you back to that place of divine love. So then you can respond, you know, from that space. And that's what I was thinking about as you were sharing. Yeah. Thank you for That's such a good reminder. Someone said to me one time, um, I can't remember who it was, but said, I feel so loved when I'm around you. I just feel so loved. And I thought about that because I wasn't like, I wasn't like I was projecting all this gushy love onto them, but I realized it was in those moments that her and I were connecting that I was feeling the most self-love. And I find that really fascinating when you're in a place of self-love, you are also channeling God's love and you're projecting that onto other people and then they will feel of your love. If there's a lack of self-love and there's a lot of insecurity being projected out, then people are not going to feel loved when they're around you. They're going to feel judged <laughs> because, because you've been... You've allowed yourself to be pulled away from self. And now you're in like an egoic state that is fearful, fear-driven, um, in a state of lack, in a state of not enoughness. And that is, to me, that is, you know, if you want to talk about uh, religious, the way that religion sometimes sees it is that that's what the devil does to you. That's what the adversary does to you is he wants you to see yourself as not enough. There's something wrong with you. And so if you, if you buy into that and you believe that there is something wrong with you, you're going to carry around all kinds of shady beliefs that aren't even true that will disconnect you from your own love. It'll disconnect you from God's love and it will disconnect you from the love of other people that you could potentially share with others. So then there is no oneness. You can't have oneness if there's not self-love, God love, God's love and, and, and the sharing or channeling of that love to another human. You can't have oneness without it. And I think that the adversary knows that. And so his greatest desire is to take you down and to make you feel in a state of lack or incompleteness or not sovereign or insecure in yourself. So if you want to love the world and if you want oneness, if you want to create Zion, and I really hope that each and every one of you who watch this wants that because that's what we're doing. That is what we're doing. That is how the city of Enoch was translated through high, high levels of godly love, self-love, and then channeling that out into the grid and connecting through oneness, through that medium. So if you want to connect to the medium of oneness in a society, like little green men are not going to parachute down and create Zion for us. Christ's not going to come and, and say, okay, I got this, guys. You all back your U-Hauls up in, in the city and move in. And now it's just this loving place where everyone just feels loved all the time. We will do that work. We are doing that work. That is what this is. Little one person at a time, one human at a time. There's 13 people on this call right now. 13 people at a time creating self-love 
God love and then connecting out into the network through the medium of the highest levels of love. That's Zion. That is how you do it. And then you go out into your network. If all 13, 14 of us go out into our networks and create that oneness, that's how it's expanded exponentially. Okay, Tammy has a comment. Go ahead, Tammy. I just love being in this class every week. I really look forward to it. And I wasn't able to last week. So when I watched the replay, you had mentioned the topic for today. And I was like, oh, I hope she covers that because I think it's so relevant. And as I'm sitting here listening to these principles and um, pondering on how I've been able to apply them in my life, I've been feeling just really rewarded with the the fact that, um, yeah, I have been practicing these principles in um, my family life and my social world. And um, it's definitely been so beneficial. And I like what you said, Janet, about building Zion. And I think about how that's happening just for me in my own little circle right now. And I get that Maybe that might not be the case for everyone, but as I think back over the last couple of years that I've been learning these principles and how blessed I've been for learning them and as I've applied them, I think, wow, I am in such a good place and such a better place than I would have otherwise been. Um, I think about the kind of person that I was. Um, I... I really kind of reflected this um, aura of um, perceiving everyone to need to be a certain way. Oh, and that was such a disservice to not only myself, but especially to them. And as I've been able to step back and allow myself to come through and allow my family to come through and be who they really are, oh my goodness, it's just made a world of difference. Um, there is more unity. There is more connection, which is something I thrive on. I am the kind of person that loves to feel connected and unified. And that is happening because I'm no longer placing this expectation on my loved ones that they need to be a certain way. And yeah. when I step back and I let my husband, for example, be kind of goofy and maybe irreverent. But you know what? That's okay. Because who I am and who he, he is, we balance each other so beautifully. And that also um, reflects onto our children and allows for them to be in a safe place where they can be who they really are. And when they make mistakes or have struggles, then they're safe to be able to come to us, not to friends, not to the internet, right? And we're able to work together to have that unity and that bond and that connectedness that we're all striving and wanting to achieve. Yeah. Um, in Zion. Yeah. yeah, we crave it. We, I think as human beings, we crave that connectedness, that oneness, but no one has taught us how to do it until now. I feel that individuals are being taught and inspired by God personally to learn these things. I didn't come up with any of these things. I just have observed them in others. And so thank you, Tammy, for sharing that. I, we benefit so much when you guys share your wisdom and how these principles are impacting your lives. So I, I really appreciate you sharing that witness that this does matter. And it, and it is, uh, these are valuable. I mean, could there be anything more important to talk about and to work on and to pursue? No, there couldn't. Anybody else have anything that they want to add to the conversation? Any experiences that maybe you have had? How has learning about and exercising, I guess, uh, you, these principles of sovereignty throughout this year. How has it impacted you? Has it changed you? Has it changed your relationships? Has it changed the way that you see the world? Has it made you less judgmental? 
Um, I'll give you a minute to ponder on that because I would love to hear. Just a lot less judgmental. Ah, I remember you said, I, you said, how, let, how a place for them to be who they are or something. I may not have said it exactly the way you did, but I thought, oh, okay. I don't have to point out, <laughs> just like you were saying earlier, that you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to point out all the flaws or make them aware that you're right and they're wrong. Yeah. I think, Karen, I love that because I can see it happening all over on the internet, especially as people are starting to come out of systems and society and they're starting to recognize, oh, okay, I am a sovereign being. I can connect directly with the divine, with God. Lots of people are leaving their churches and their religion and even family um, uh, for many, many different reasons. And so when, when that pulling apart happens in these systems and society, it's really easy to kind of battle back and forth. Hey, I'm right. You're wrong. You got it wrong. You're seeing it in a wrong light. And I did all this research and I did all this studying and, um, and shaming others for still being in the position that they're in when, you know, I, I don't know. I'm seeing a lot of that on the internet and uh, it's interesting to watch it. It's interesting to observe it because that is kind of the nature of our human condition, the way that we've been programmed. But like you said, Karen, it's okay to just let go of the judgment and just let people be where they are. Well, when you first come to a knowledge, like you said about church, and you realize that you've been you've been lied to for decades it's really hard to stay calm in the beginning it took me a while to calm down <laughs> Just, and now I realize okay but you you know what you know but you don't have to blast it out there and like you said when the spirit directs they're not ready to receive it don't push it yeah uh I haven't really shared much about my journey um with with my religious community um but i was kind of pushed out of that community um because of certain beliefs that i have that don't mirror up or they don't they don't align with where the leadership of that community wants all of the beliefs to align and so because of that there was a lot of shaming and shunning that happened and there was one day in particular where i continued to attend my church services with my husband because I wanted to support him in that. I just, I, I didn't want him to have to go alone and I wanted to support him in that, but it was really hard for me to be there because I just, I did feel so judged <laughs> and I was feeling all those feelings. I was feeling um, isolated and shamed. Um, I don't know if you've ever been through a situation like that, but they, they do kind of isolate you and, um, there are things you can't do. You can't participate in all these different ways. And so because you can't participate, you do feel very alone, like you've been put in the corner. And I didn't want to be there in the midst of all that. And I, it was Mother's Day. And I, we went to church. We we're sitting in the parking lot. And I said to my husband, I don't want to be here. I just don't want to be here. It's so painful for me to be here. And it's hard. And I don't like those feelings that, that I'm feeling. And he said, then don't be here for you be here for someone else. And that was when a light bulb went off and I was like, you know what? You're right. I am up in my ego right now. I'm feeling sorry for myself, thinking that, I mean, all the shaming and the shunning and blah, 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 all that stuff. Yes, people do that, but I didn't need to make it about me. And so I went into that church meeting. I sat by a friend. I connected with someone. I made a new friend. Um, I ha had a wonderful conversation with someone at the end of one of the classes I went to and really connected deeply um, with a new friend and ha and was able to continue to do that. And it was really meaningful and powerful for me to just not be there for myself, but to be there for someone else. Um, and you got to let go of judgment. 
to do that. Even if you think you're the one that was wronged or they lied to me or they treated me like this or like that, there's still good people everywhere in every system, every religion, every church meeting, every every place you can go, you're always going to find good people. And so when we are willing to be humble and out of judgment, out of a place of judgment, then you can find that true connection with another human. But you got to let go of the judgment. <laughs> right? Oh, that's hard. <laughs> it is hard. But it can be done. So I appreciate that. Um, and so, that. <laughs> go ahead. Say that again. I just said I haven't been back since um since i woke up to this is so corrupt and i'm it's we're both in the same yeah. religion so i don't know i i love the people it's not against people i don't think i can sit still in to meetings and hear praise going on to the leaders I, I would have to, I would have to get out. I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. Yeah. I, I'm just, well, mm. Yeah. And in I'm a not situation just, like that, you, you have to follow your themselves. own. Yeah. You have to follow your own heart, obviously. Right. You can't, you can't put yourself in a place where you're going to just feel um, abusive, uh, tra abused, but for sure, just listen to your heart. And, um, and I know that you do that. And, uh, and I know that you love people for who they are. Anne says African term, I am because we are. Oh, that's interesting. That's beautiful. Okay. Any other thoughts or any other things to add to the conversation or are we good to wrap this up for today? Did I put the word in there? Ubuntu? Oh, no, you didn't. Can you put the ah. word there? Yeah. Spell it's it. Ubuntu. Uh, I used to work at the camp with inner city kids. Uh, and um, it was called Camp Ubuntu, and that's why I first learned that term. I am because we are. And if you ever look that up, you'll see stories in these African villages. Uh, when someone does something wrong uh, or negative, instead of punishing them, they bring that person in the center of the village and everyone surrounds them. And everyone tells stories about all the good things they have done all the wonderful things they are. And it, that person is showered with so much reminders of how great they are that they come out of that, like never doing that negative wrong thing again. It's like, they're just reminded of their goodness. So isn't that beautiful? It, it makes me weep because if, if we did that as a society, there would be no prisons. Right. Yeah. Oh, that, that's that? beautiful. Well, we can do that, right? <laughs> yeah, we definitely can do that. Reprove with sharpness, but also, could did you spell the term? Did you type it into the chat? Yes, it's U B U N T U. Ubuntu. Yeah. Well, that's a great note to end on. I think we're going to just end on that. Um, Ubuntu. Uh, it's African for I am. I am because we are. Okay. It's that oneness, creating that oneness. So that's the note that I'm going to end on. I feel like for today, we're going to end just a tiny bit early. Thank you for being here. Also, just a reminder over on my website, greatlifegreaterimpact.com. If you have registered or if you're a, a subscriber to the website, um, we're going to do some healing today around anxiety. We're going to release anxiety inside of us, reconnect with the inner self. Uh, I will be posting three new videos. I post three new videos of learning and content every single Friday. And so if you are a subscriber, watch for that new content that's being put into the database. You can also type into the search bar. Um, you can search for different topics, whatever it is that you're looking for, and watch classes that pertain to exactly what you need in the time that you need it. Um, but I will be sharing. So this, this is, we're going to share excerpts of this video in the members area, but I'm also going to share um, past classes that I've done on sovereign relationships. You'll get the handouts to those. And um, you'll also, we're going to be focusing on anxieties. We come into December through the holidays 
And um, we're going to do a live healing session, a group live healing session today uh, at noon central. That would be 11 Mountain, 10 Pacific, and 1 Eastern. Boy, I really had to dig that out of my brain to get it. So if you uh, have an interest in that, this is, this is a wonderful way to have healing sessions once a week with me in a group setting. Um, I will drop the link to that in the replay of this video over on YouTube when you guys get the replay. It should be up by this afternoon. So watch for that. But if in the meantime, okay. you've got an hour to go get yourself subscribed over to the website and um, participate in that. Did you have a question, Karen? No. Nope. Yes. Oh. Okay. Who who exactly was Lilith? I mean, was she like a fallen angel too, along with Satan? What was the? Because you mentioned Lilith and Satan. I'm like, huh? Uh, well, that's my Lucy, belief. Or, like, earlier. I'm, I can't go deep into that today, but you guys can do some research on that if you want to research the story of Satan and Lilith. You could go research that. Um, definitely. Like, I don't know that it's, it, that we don't have time to go deep down that rabbit hole. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, you could definitely do some research. There are, there are stories that you can find. Obviously you have to take it with a grain of salt. Um, discover what the Lord says to you about all of that. Cause it's just data, but, um, that is that's the belief in some of this, these stories, ancient stories that have been put out there is that their relationship really was built, founded in lust, lust oh. and ownership and codependency and control and manipulation, all the things that it, that's that's how this world op operates. Right. Yeah. So if you look at yeah. how relationships have been filtered down to us, it, it's a pretty good mirror system of how it how it all began when the corruption first began but that's not really that's not how we as divine beings are designed to operate it goes against our nature as divinity so um anyway just some things to ponder and think about as you take that into account codependency is toxic it's not healthy and we're not wired for codependency or ownership, but that's what's programmed deeply in mm -hmm. culture, in religion, in society, in family, in all the things. These are my children. This is my spouse. Don't you dare look at my spouse. Don't you dare talk to my spouse. Don't you dare have eyes or whatever. You know, my spouse, my children, my, 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 me, me, me. Um, we're not wired for that. I, again, the beginning statement in this class was Zion is being one with many. That's what Zion is, being one with many. You can't be one with many if there's a lot of clinginess and ownership and jealousy and restriction and coercion and manipulation, all of those things. They have to be weeded through our system. And, and God will teach that if you ask the right questions, take those questions to, to father and ask, what does this look like for me in my life with where I'm at right now in my relationships? How can I be one with many? And what does that look like? And what does it mean to you? So there you go. That's a great note to end on. Thank you guys for being <laughs> Thank here. You. Thank you Thank for you your so comments. Thank you for your participation. It always makes these classes so much better when you guys are willing to intuitively share the things that have been revealed to you. So I think that we all benefit when we share together. So thank you for being here. I love you all. Take care and we'll see you next week. Mwah. And then come over to our healing session in an hour. All right. Take care. Talk to you later. Bye.